This is the end of the Lenten season. If you haven't quite gotten in the groove of what Lent is all about, take a look at this short video. Maybe it will help you. Okay, Jenna, can we run that one more time? This time while you watch it, notice the exasperated shrug of the guy just before the sheep jumps in the second time. It's great. <laughs> okay. There you go. During this holy season of Lent, we do what Christian communities have been doing for thousands of years. We pay special attention to Jesus' life and teachings and to the way he died. Here at Second, we've tried to pay special attention during this season to Jesus' identity as a peacemaker and to his blessing on all of us who will join his peacemaking project. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called God's children. Today on Palm Sunday, we're moving into Holy Week, into the end of the Lenten season as we prepare for our celebration of joy next week on Easter. And we began our service today by waving our palms and singing Hosanna, theatrically enacting Jesus' entry into Jerusalem for the final week of his life. He would be arrested on Thursday, crucified on Friday afternoon. He enters Jerusalem as a peacemaker, and he refuses to flinch from his God-given calling to bring peace, even in the face of violent opposition from jealous religious rulers and nervous political authorities. For three years, Jesus has been announcing and enacting God's gift of shalom in public. And once that parade made its way into Jerusalem, Jesus then heads straight to the temple, throws out those who are buying and selling. He pushes over the tables and chairs used by those who were exchanging currencies and selling animals for sacrifice. He quotes uh, a line from Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7, saying, my house will be called a house of prayer. And then he criticizes those in charge for using religion as a covering to hide their violent and unjust behavior. Jesus the Jew has an imagination saturated with the stories and symbols of Scripture. And his Bible reading fosters an anger that energizes his criticism of the way things work and his commitment to imagine better and more beautiful alternatives. He expresses that anger in public in ways that call attention to the problematic behavior of those who were in charge. He stirs the pot, and yet he never chooses violence, retaliation, or revenge. So here, at the end of a Lenten sermon series on seeking shalom, on becoming God's friends as peacemakers, we come to a pregnant, pregnant moment, an opportunity for us to turn our lives in new directions. So a couple of questions before our scripture reading. What if peacemaking is the life I've been looking for all along? What if belonging to a community of others following Jesus together turns out to be the most satisfying way to live? And one more, can I stick with this peacemaking project even if it involves me in conflict and confrontation? Even if it requires that I metabolize my anger and learn to guide it wisely and productively? So I want to read uh, today from Matthew's version of Jesus' death. Uh, if you want to, it's a, it's a little bit longer. It will take about four minutes, so just a little longer than our normal readings. If you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, it would be page 1211, 1211 in those pew Bibles. So I'll read from Matthew 27, verses 11 through 14, and then 27 to 54. 
So listen now uh, for God's voice to you in this Holy Week reading. Jesus was brought before the governor. The governor said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you say. But he didn't answer when the chief priests and elders accused him. Then Pilate said, don't you hear the testimony they bring against you? But he didn't answer, not even a single word. So the governor was greatly amazed. I'll jump now to verse 27 if you're reading along. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's house, and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a red military coat on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand. Then they bowed down in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hey, king of the Jews. After they spit on him, they took the stick and struck his head again and again. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the military coat and put his own clothes back on him. They led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found Simon, a man from Cyrene. They forced him to carry Jesus' cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means skull place, they gave Jesus wine mixed with vinegar to drink. But after tasting it, he didn't want to drink it. After they crucified him, they divided up his clothes among them by drawing lots. They sat there guarding him. They placed above his head the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. They crucified him with two outlaws, one on his right side and one on his left. Those who were walking by insulted Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, so you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself. If you are God's son, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the legal experts and the elders, were making fun of him, saying, You saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel, so let him come down from the cross now. Then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, so let God deliver him now if he wants to. He said, I'm God's son. The outlaws who were crucified with him insulted him in the same way. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At about three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, He's calling Elijah. One of them ran over, took a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest of them said, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. Again, Jesus cried out with a loud shout. Then he died. Look, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they came out of their graves and went into the holy city where they appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and what had just happened, they were filled with awe and said, this was certainly God's son. May God bless the reading of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. Just a moment of silence after that reading. This sermon won't be a long one for the next few minutes. I just want to put before you a question, and it's this. What steps do you want to take next in becoming a peacemaking follower of Jesus? I'm not going to argue about how Jesus' death saves you and ushers you into this peacemaking way of life. I'm not going to try to motivate you to soften your grip on your current life or to open yourself to new experiments in living. 
I'm simply going to assume that you are here, that all of us are here because God's Spirit has awakened in us this desire to respond to God's love by seeking shalom. So let me ask you again, what steps do you want to take next in becoming a peacemaking follower of Jesus? So a few possibilities to spark your imagination. Does the good news of God's shalom call you to communicate with less violence and more kindness? One option. Is God calling you to tend with more care to the way you interact with other people? Perhaps you feel compelled to become a better listener, creating more room for others to communicate their needs, releasing your grip on the need to be right. If speaking and listening with more grace and empathy in conflicted relationships or in your social media feeds perhaps feels like a promising growth area for you, God might be calling you to embody peacemaking as a nonviolent communicator. That'd be a wonderful way to take a next step. Or maybe this good news of God's shalom will motivate us to take up more peaceful ways of relating to ourselves. Kristen's sermon earlier in this series explored how we might learn to make peace within our own hearts, forgiving and accepting ourselves so that we can learn to extend that kindness, that warmth to others. So if you feel called to explore ways to relate to yourself with less violence, less anger, less judgment, less criticism, that will be a pivotal, pivotal doorway into new possibilities. Jesus teaches that we respond to God's love by learning to love both others and ourselves. And Kristen's sermon was a reminder for all of us to keep those two things together. Or maybe God is calling some of us into the difficult work of peacemaking within our families. That was our conversation last week. Relating well and wisely to our families is one of the toughest tests there is for peacemaking. Some of you have been deeply hurt by family members. Some of you are worn out from trying to relate in healthy ways to siblings, parents, children, in-laws. Some of you have come to the realization that it's time to let go. Time to invest your energy in other directions to create some alternative context for the care and support and encouragement that you need. Letting go of patterns that are stale or harmful so that you can relate to others in fresh ways, that is no small thing. This is the way God's Spirit can often shift our energy from negativity and complaining towards fresh openings for what's next. In this Seeking Shalom series, we've largely focused on interpersonal matters, relational forms of peacemaking. But some of you will be inspired by God's Spirit to forms of peacemaking that will be more oriented to politics and public policy, social justice, and nonviolent activism. Good for you. Here at Second, some of our advocacy work, our activism, our social justice efforts are coordinated by our Matthew 25 committee. I am really grateful for the passionate leadership of this group of people in areas of racial and economic justice particularly. So if you're here and you just need a way to get started, I can't think of a better option than just getting more involved with the ministry sponsored by our Matthew 25 team. But they would be the first people to tell you that they don't have a monopoly on the range of causes or the kinds of projects that God might be stirring up in your heart. You may have specific experiences or passions that direct your energies towards particular kinds of problem solving. I can't name them all, but here's a few. In the wake of recent gun violence in Nashville, you may be ready to collaborate with other people on sensible gun reform. Or voting rights. Or environmental justice and climate change matters. Or refugee resettlement. Or immigration policy or literacy programs in schools, or labor efforts to promote a living wage and just compensation, or promoting entrepreneurship in low-income neighborhoods, or work working for LGBTQIA rights, or police reform, or creating compassionate services for those living with substance use issues, or supporting victims of domestic violence, 
or broadening access to higher education, or championing affordable housing as a civic priority, or promoting better sex education and sexual health for all, or getting involved in campaign finance reform, or a little less directly, but no less important, you might be a creative person. And you might feel called by God to use creative forms of expression and art to bend our imagination in new directions. Maybe you're someone who feels called to write good stories or provocative poems. A person who seeks peace by the way you play music or edit video or do graphic design or by folding little paper cranes. Who knows? The options are limitless. So friends, please don't try to do all of these things. That wasn't meant to be an exhaustive list, just a little provocation for you. Just find the next thing, the next step that makes sense for you. And no matter what that next step is for you, let, remi let me remind you just of a few things. First, you might stir up some good trouble. Your family might make fun of you. People at work might talk behind your back. Your Aunt Gladys might make fun of you, might criticize you on Facebook. Okay. Second, whatever you decide to do as your next step, don't do it by yourself. Don't do it alone. Peacemaking can be challenging work, and it's only sustainable when we do it with friends, when we mix some joy and laughter and play into the sweat and the tears. Third, finally, don't let anybody else tell you what God is calling you to do next. If you defer to someone else's calling, if you default into someone else's passion project, you probably won't last. So there's no particular step you need to take, but God's love has placed you onto this path, and you do need to keep moving. That's why this entire Lenten season, that's what this entire Lenten season about the journey has been aiming for. We have been praying for God's Spirit to sweep us into joyful practices of peacemaking. And I can't wait to find out some of the ways God is calling you a little further in this journey.